About a decade ago, Fortune released this article saying that most of our jobs were going to get automated. With one exception. Artists had a high degree of resistance. This hasn't aged so well. Today, over 15 billion images have been generated by AI, and I've contributed to those numbers too. The results are captivating, and I think they speak for themselves, but it also stirred mixed emotions in me. As a software engineer, I was proud of how much progress we made in such little time and excited to see what would come next. But I'm also a digital illustrator. It's been a passion of mine since I was just 11 years old, and I've carried that with me through college, co-founding the Digital Illustration Association at Northeastern. The illustrator in me felt fear. Fear that human creativity, which we had for so long believed to be uniquely ours, was being encroached upon. You might not know how to feel about AI art. It really snuck up on us. Just a couple years ago, I could look at a drawing and immediately tell if it was AI generated. It had a pretty uncanny style of shading, and it was littered with mistakes, like having eight fingers on one hand. Now, it's so hard to tell the difference between human and AI art that you might not have guessed I flipped those labels. It might seem like magic, but in reality, this is the result of an incredibly resource-intensive process. An AI is like a blank slate. It can't generate anything of value, not until it's trained. But even though we use the phrase training, the way AI trains and the way humans train are very different. We see this image the way it's displayed on the slide. But to an AI, it sees a bunch of number values, values representing the color of an individual pixel block that makes up a digital image. And the AI's goal during training is to identify quantitative patterns between these values and the text characters, the words we're using to describe this image. These patterns are things that might not even be comprehensible to us, things we don't even have words for. AI companies gather training data from databases of hundreds of millions of images with text. These databases scrape around on the internet for things like social media posts with captions or descriptions, and images that have descriptions when you hover your mouse over them. When it's time to generate a new image, the AI doesn't just collage the training data together, however. In fact, it doesn't have any copy of those original drawings, saved anywhere. Instead, it starts with complete and random noise. And gradually, over many iterations, it'll reorganize those pixels in accordance to those patterns that it identified earlier, into what is, at least technically, a completely new image. Now that you're a little familiar with how the AI is formed, how do you use it? The most common way is through text prompting. You throw it a bunch of phrases describing what you want it to make, and the AI will try its best. This doesn't always work out, however, because the AI doesn't actually know what you're describing. It has no concept of what short, curly hair is. It just knows that this phrase tends to be associated with these patterns in the color values. That's why generative AI can behave in ways that we would find strange, ways that a human would never behave. For example, take Midjourney. If you prompt it with the phrase Afghan girl, it tends to generate images like this one that are beautiful but also have a striking resemblance to a very famous, very copyrighted photograph by that very name. It was so bad that Midjourney had to ban the phrase entirely. Now, we as people know that not every image of an Afghan girl has to involve a portrait where her body is facing slightly off center. She's looking directly into the camera with green eyes and a burqa. But to the AI, it only knows what it's been shown. To the AI, that's just what an Afghan girl looks like. AI, when given too much control over the direction of the image, can behave in strange ways, but there are ways to counteract that as well. 
by providing it with some human guidance. For example, I wasn't a huge fan of how it initially generated a fish behind the girl. So I indicated a specific area of the image that I wanted it to regenerate and instructed it what to put there. If you do this iteratively or do it over small areas of an image, you can actually control a lot of the fine details of what's generated. People can also do some pretty cool things like provide the AI with human-drawn line art and ask it to generate an image roughly based on it. Or they can pose a 3D model in Blender and the AI will be instructed to generate a character with that pose. It is a lot of work to correct an image in a way that you actually get what you wanted. And it's also a lot of work to create a model that's good enough to potentially do that on the first try. That's why these services can get expensive. Midjourney, for example, costs about $100 to $1,000 a year, depending on which plan you get. Unfortunately, the artists that were used to train the AI see none of this money, even if their artwork was copyrighted. That's why Getty Images, a database of copyrighted stock photos, recently started a lawsuit against an AI image generator. It was producing fake stock photos in the Getty Images style, reproducing details as small as legible watermarks. The court is still undecided on whether this was a legal use of copyrighted images, but it all depends on how they interpret fair use. The fair use clause in the US protects you if you're using someone else's copyrighted artwork for your own purposes, but it only protects you under certain circumstances. There are unofficially five factors that go into this decision, but I'd like to drill down on three of them that I believe are controversial in the topic of AI art. First, the new work should be transformative. That means it should be adding value that the original artwork did not provide through additional expression, meaning, or insight. Second, it shouldn't be damaging to the original copyright owner's income. This could be real measured impact on income or just taking away from their potential market. Third, the judge always has discretion. It's truly up to them to determine whether they believe one case of fair use is good or bad. So should fair use apply to AI art? Well, first, is it transformative? I'd like to make a distinction here between the AI and the art that it generates. We saw that there are many ways that as a person you can influence the process of generating an AI art piece. Each point of contact with a human in that process is an opportunity for the user to add meaning in a way that the AI is technically impossible, uh, incapable of doing. That means that AI art can be transformative. The issue is the AI itself. The AI is the direct product of these copyrighted works. And it's not an artwork, it's a service, it's a tool. And that means it doesn't inherently have any meaning or expression. It also doesn't provide us with any additional insights. This might be surprising to you considering how it analyzes patterns and that's kind of its whole job. But in reality, these patterns that it's analyzed are incomprehensible to us. Something being data doesn't make it information. Second, it can be damaging to the original copyright owner's potential income. Take Adobe Firefly, their new generative AI service. You can provide it with an artist's name and it'll produce images in their iconic style. This puts it in direct competition with the original artist. Why commission an expensive custom artwork when you can buy a much cheaper service and generate many more images? Third, is it subjectively good or bad? There is no right answer to this in truth, but I implore you to consider that fair use was put into place to protect and encourage creativity. 
Allowing AI companies to scrape and train on whatever they want without getting the artist's consent de-incentivizes artists from being creative in the first place and posting their artwork online. Even if, as an artist, you don't copyright your work, what is legal to do and what's ethical to do are two different questions. A lot of the times, laws are constantly just catching up to ethics. Consider that a lot of the times, it's impractical for artists to obtain copyright on their work. It costs $35 a pop, which might not seem like much to you, but it really adds up for someone who's drawing every day. And that might not make sense if you're a student or a hobbyist that doesn't receive much income from artwork in the first place. Just because someone can't afford legal protection doesn't mean that on a personal level, it's right to breach the boundaries that they've set. If we keep disrespecting artists in this way, it might not end well or be sustainable for AI companies. That's because there are constantly tools being developed to protect artists. UChicago developed one called Nightshade that will modify the values of an image such that it's mostly imperceivable to us. But an AI will look at an image and believe that it's something that it's most definitely not. This actively damages the quality and accuracy of the AI that trains on this poisoned image. This is the worst ending for both AI companies and even for artists, because AI can empower creativity. My favorite example of this was this game from the 90s called Broken Sword. The creators wanted to remaster the game, completely redo the visuals for a modern audience but they only had six people in the company. That's not nearly enough hands to recreate an entire game. The only reason why they were able to execute this project successfully is because they trained a model on their own artists to handle grunt work. Similarly, AI can help artists on individual pieces. Back in my day, if I created a canvas that was way too small and started drawing on it, I would realize after a while that Zooming in on the image, it actually looks really pixely. The only solution to this would have been to create a brand new canvas of a larger size and redraw the entire thing. Now, professional illustration software like Clip Studio have AI upscaling that will do this automatically. It can also help with the creative process. Before you commit to a specific color palette, you can preview it using AI just with Chicken scratch, just mark down what colors you want approximately where, and it'll produce something that will let you feel the vibe of a palette before you commit to it. Ideally, we reap the benefits to creativity without abusing creatives. I believe this is possible if legal regulation takes the side of the artist more than it is now. There are two principles to this. First, Companies should be required to obtain consent from an artist before using their artwork for training. And as a result of this, companies will need some way of compensating artists for their work. This can be through contracts such as licensing agreements. Right now, AI is a thief. But in the future, it could be another tool in an artist's workshop freeing up their hands from tedious tasks and allowing them to focus more on just being creative. Thank you.